Hello Peak Performer, welcome back to the Stress Podcast. I am really excited to welcome you to a very special podcast episode today because in today's podcast episode, I'm going to share a podcast that I was interviewed on last year. I don't think I've ever done this over the past more than 150 podcast episodes that I recorded, created and published for you. But I thought this is a really wonderful opportunity to share with you a different podcast and to share with you a different perspective of how I am talking about burnout with other people as well. And so Gabriela Guzman invited me to speak on her podcast Escape from the Burnout Society about my own experience and we had a really wonderful conversation that I really didn't want to miss but share with you. In this podcast, we are talking about how making the wrong choices will lead you to burn out even in great work environments. And I think when you're listening to this right now, you might be somewhat able to relate to this. So I'm excited to share this podcast with you. I hope that you get some inspiration and some new strategies or ideas on how to overcome burnout or avoid burnout and obviously sustain your performance over time. On February 2nd, 2022, so only a week from now, I am going to start the Peak Performance Method program again. <laughs> I have done this only once before and this is basically the second time where I am going to coach you live for 10 weeks on the Peak Performance Method. This is a unique opportunity for you if you feel like you need somewhat of an accountability and commitment group in order to make sure that you are sticking to the goals that you set yourself for your life for 2022. And so I invite you to join us. I would really love to have you. It's going to be incredible. We are going to dive really, really deep into making new habits, creating new habits, creating new routines, looking at your values, making sure that you have set your systems up for success. So managing your time, setting boundaries, communicating these boundaries with vulnerability to your stakeholders, to your clients, to the people that are important for you. And we're obviously diving even deeper because I believe that it is super, super important to talk as well about mindset, talk about forgiveness, talk about how to build resilience and why emotional intelligence is so, so connected to productivity and performance. So if you say, yes, let's do it. I really need some changes in my life and I need a group in order to help me be accountable, then join us. If you would like to have more information, make sure that you come to my website www.peakperformancemethod.com or send me an email to julia at peakperformancemethod.com and we will get you enrolled. And yeah, that's all I wanted to share with you today. So I would say let's jump into the podcast interview with Gabriela Guzman and I really hope to see you at the Peak Performance Method program for 2022. Take care and talk to you soon. Welcome to Escape from the Burnout Society. I'm your host, Gabriela Guzman, and today I will interview Julia Arndt, who is a stress management trainer, sought after international speaker, and the founder of the Peak Performance Method. Julia was born in Germany and has lived in five countries over the last 14 years. She had a very busy kind of lifestyle that had seemed excellent, but it was taking a toll on many aspects of her life. As a high performer working for Google, she worked long hours, drove long distances, and after too many cups of coffee later, Julia found herself experiencing a burnout. She, wa she wants to share now her story with us to help others and let everybody know what she wishes she had known at the beginning of her career. She has now her own consultant and coaching business and has helped more than 5,000 employees at very innovative companies to understand more the effects of stress on the body and how to build a mindful lifestyle that delivers focus, high energy and productivity. Julia, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here today. <laughs> Julia, well, I think my first question is going to, to be about your career mm -hmm. and how did you get into this path? And of course, you can also tell us about what happened with your 
burnout, how you got there. Um, so explain us. Yes. Well, you've already gave, given actually a perfect introduction because usually the first thing that I always say is that I'm from Germany because people wonder where my accent is from when I speak English. So we've talked about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, my journey, my career journey, my burnout journey. So yeah, so you mentioned as well. So I started to work for Google in Dublin in, the, in October 2011. And um, I worked there as an account manager, moved up the ranks. I got promoted in 2014, moved to Mountain View, California, to their headquarters and um, got into a project and program management role and worked for Google in total for seven and a half years. And I was always really interested in being healthy. And I was always really interested in sports psychology. I did a sports psychology um, diploma. I have a gym instructor certification. I have 400 hours of yoga teacher training. I was always really interested in the human body and also in the mind in a way. But I think until I burned out, I wasn't aware how important mental health actually was. So that was a really interesting journey for me because in um, July, August 2018, I went to the doctors because I didn't really quite feel like myself anymore. I couldn't really pinpoint really what was going on. I was healthy in a way, like physically I, I felt healthy, but I felt really depressed and unhappy. And I just knew that something had to change. I felt like I wasn't myself anymore. And so I went to the doctor and they gave me two questionnaires um, one on depression and one on anxiety because burnout was only recognized as an official disease by the World Health Organization in May 2019. I'm sure you've mentioned this in the podcast probably before, but um, so there wasn't really a questionnaire on burnout itself, but I answered all of these different questions and it was the first, I think, eye-opening moment for me where I said yes to uh, all of these questions that were on the survey uh, on that questionnaire. And I was like, wow, I can't believe this is not normal because I just, this was the new normal for me, right? Over the years, it has just become my new lifestyle. And I never really questioned it because in my head, from my standpoint and my awareness, I was healthy. I worked out four or five times a week. I ate healthy foods. I was even known as kind of the go-to person um, in my team as like, you know, when we, when people had like any questions around lifestyle and fitness, they would come to me and ask me. So that was a super opening moment. So I had a conversation with the doctor and she said, it looks like you're really struggling right now. And I said, yes, I'm really struggling. Um, and she's like, yeah, it's, you know, like you're, you're having burnout. And I was like, wow, okay. So this is, this is what it feels like. This is what it is. Right. And there were physical symptoms as well associated to my burnout, not just, you know, the unhappiness and the sadness and the depressed state, but also the anxious state, but also digestive issues, sleep issues, um, all of these different kinds of things. Right. And so I decided to take a three months medical leave in order to take care of myself and really understand what happened to me and how I went down that road. Um, and I learned a lot about myself in these three months. I did a coaching actually certification during that time because I had previously, before I even know I would go on a medical leave and um, I would need to take time off. I actually signed up for this coaching certification. So it was kind of perfect timing that that happened. And then, so I learned a lot about myself during that time. Um, and then I went to a stress management training in Germany um, for three days. And I felt really inspired because I thought to myself, it's so interesting that there are so many tools available to support us in our mental health, but we still rarely talk about it. There's still a lot of stigma around it. And then I talked to an audience member at that workshop and I told him a little bit about me. I told him that I live in California and that I work for Google and that I just experienced burnout. And he was so shocked. He said to me, wow, you work for Google. I thought this is the company where you have the best work-life balance and, and people never burn out because it's such a beautiful right culture and such a beautiful campus. And I said to him, you know, you can have all these external factors that are really wonderful, but you can still be a person that burns out because of the choices that you make, the habits that you have created, the routines that you have. And so that kind of sparked this like idea in my head to help other people, especially in the tech world, um, to understand better 
where burnout comes from and how to prevent it. Because many, what, what I think the, one of the biggest interesting things that happened to me during that time was when I burned out, I obviously created a lot of awareness around why I, it happened and how I got there and what science actually tried to tell me that I was burning out. Um, and when I started to look at resources, because obviously Google is an amazing company and they do have a lot of benefits for their employees. So, um, you know, I could take a medical leave and there were internal resources that talked about burnout. But up until the point that I did burn out, I had never heard about burnout. So in my head, I was like, OK, something obviously needs to be done to help people understand burnout before they even get there. And so that is really my mission. That is why I left Google and why I started my own company called the Peak Performance Method. Because I really, really have the vision and the mission to help employees set up a set of skills to sustain their performance over time without ever even getting into that burnout state. And that's where I am today. Wow. Well, I see so many uh, coincidences. I mean, I am also, um, I have also a degree as a running instructor and I was also very in, um, interested in the body. And, mm -hmm. and of course, when I got a burn, I felt like how, I mean, I know everything about training and overtraining. Yeah. I mean, how, how can I get burned out? <laughs> it's not possible. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it is. And that is what uh, one of the most important things I have talked about in this podcast is the, that there shouldn't be a stigma on telling everyone that even in uh, companies where they have uh, so much resources, it happens. It, yeah. it, it can happen. And many people, it happened to many people. You know, I'm not like the the only case and you know i work with companies today like facebook and microsoft and uber and there's people everywhere that burn out you know that's it's not just a an isolated case it's something that happens unfortunately in today's world very regularly yeah exactly and as an insider can i ask you something because i yes, wanted please. always to ask about <laughs> this i mean i heard that google has uh, this a nap system that you you can have a nap or meditate during your working time how how is how is this uh, range house uh, the facility yeah. yeah yes that's true yeah we have nap pots um, and we have rooms where you can go and lay down we have meditation rooms where you can go and um, sit in meditation um, and those are all things that i actually did use before i left google in order to manage my anxiety and manage my thoughts um so yeah it's all available um but and I think, you know, the people that are aware, they will use that. But I think there are still too many people unaware, too many people that are too busy, right? I think there's always that that um, balance between, okay, I have all of these things available to me, right? I have the free food, I have the gyms, I have the nap pots. Um, but then you have also a calendar that is full from nine to five. And when you're not managing your time well and you're not setting boundaries and you don't really understand what you actually need in, other, in order to sustain your performance, then you will not use those things. And then, you know, you can have all the amazing tools and things in the world at your fingertip but if you don't use it then you will you know you will still experience burnout burnout yeah yeah i, I thought it was the like ideal place a place where i could sleep sleep um, <laughs> so i i like to take naps that's really uh, uh one of my advices all right so well then you um you left google you start your own business mm -hmm. And the first thing I know, you know, um, I know, you know, I know you can tell more about uh, neuroscience behind overcoming limiting beliefs. And this is on mm -hmm. Skippel Burner Society. I'm emphasizing uh, beliefs, this belief system. And yeah. well, tell us, uh, tell us what you know about that. Yes. I think one thing that I want to mention as well is, is that oftentimes when people hear my story, they think, ah, oh, that was all so seamless and you just made this decision, right? Like it always seems like that from the outside, but I think it was a three year journey of me, you know, hitting walls at work and, you know, kind of moving into this more unhappy pattern. Um, and then, you know, finding all of these different things. I think now it makes a beautiful story, but while I was in it, it was, you know, I was desperate and I didn't know what to do and I didn't know where to go. And, um, there were moments of, you know, like I said, desperation and not knowing um, how to continue. But, um, 
you know, just to, to tell people that are listening right now, you know, it, it doesn't, you don't always have to have it all figured out. It took me a very long time to figure it out. And limiting beliefs was definitely one of these things, right? I remember, so I was commuting between the headquarter and Mountain View to my home in Lake Tahoe, California on a weekly basis because I fell in love here with this area, which is four hours away um, from the Bay Area. And so I was commuting around 2000 miles a month by myself. And um, that was a lot of that was a lot of um, obviously ex additional stress and pressure on me that I put on myself. And initially it was amazing. Right. Initially, I was thinking this is the best lifestyle. Like I have best of both worlds. I live in the mountains half of the time and then I have this amazing job. But at some point, you know, over the years, um, it didn't fit anymore. And, you know, I think one of my biggest limiting beliefs that I also honestly took on a little bit from other people was that belief of, I will never make as much money again in if, if I decide to become an entrepreneur, right? Like there's these like fears and, you know, no matter if you think about just changing roles or if you think about changing companies or if you think about building your own company, I think there was a lot of fear around that. And just obviously also leaving the big, the big G was, was a big decision as well that held a lot of beliefs. I, my identity, I think is still somewhat attached to Google. Um, when I, I still work, Google is one of my main clients. Um, and I still, um, I still talk about we, when I do the workshops, because I still identify so strongly as the Googler. It's, it's very, it's very smart of how they, you know, how, how you create this identity and how proud you are of being that, being a Googler by right? being, being part of this big company. And so, you know, my limiting belief, like I said, was I can never make as much money again um, when I go on my own and, you know, maybe I won't be happy. And so one of the really interesting things and one of the books that I read that really helped me through this was um, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself by Dr. Joe Dispenza. And he talks about how we can break through our habits and beliefs through neuroscience, which I think is so, so powerful and so interesting. And so I really dove into the subject and really understood, okay, what is actually happening in our brain? Because our brain, first of all, is constantly scanning the environment for threat, right? The, the goal of our brain is to always keep us safe. And the interesting thing with habits and routines is, is that our brain doesn't know what is good or bad for us. Our brain only knows what we have been repeatedly doing over and over and over again. So that explains as well why people are drug addicts or alcoholics or, um, you know, or you are in an unhealthy relationship, but you keep going back to that because you are used to it. Like you are used to that, that that's kind of the brain pattern and that brain wave that you have created. So there's basically this deep groove of, um, of what your, your wires of like what you learned over the years. And oftentimes beliefs come from, you know, they come from our childhood. So you've been thinking and believing things for 20, 30 years. Right. And in order to change that, that requires a little bit of work. And so the first step when you are trying to change your belief system is always to have that awareness that there is a limiting belief, that there is a belief that is holding you back or that is not helpful anymore. And once you have that awareness, then you can actually take action to a really shift your mindset to something more positive or to, uh, to break through that limiting belief. And I, I remember, um, I was sitting in the car on my way back to the Bay area after a weekend in Tahoe. And I was thinking to myself, who actually said that I cannot make more money building my own business? Who, where does this belief actually come from? Right. And I, I realized that that belief came from many people that surrounded me that, that held that belief as well. And so I just kind of took it on without questioning it. And so that was a really powerful step for me to be like, oh, okay, now I can work on this. You have a question? Yes, we had some uh, technical issues with our solved. Yeah, <laughs> Julia, so but I wanted just to interrupt you for a moment. Um, because these uh, limiting beliefs, I mean, when we are not aware of them, uh, we cannot change them, as you just mm -hmm. told us. But mm -hmm. what is very important for so many people, mm -hmm. what, at what moment did you thought, I have a limiting belief? And how do you recognize a limiting belief? Because people just look at them, but they cannot recognize them. It, it's a very, maybe yeah. a silly question, but can you tell us where did you recognize that it was a limiting belief? Uh. 
That's such a good question. I think it is a combination of things maybe that happen. I think it requires self-reflection, right? To ask yourself like deep questions around why do I think this way, right? Now as a coach, I see limiting beliefs all the time. You know, like when I listen to clients, when I listen to participants of my trainings and they tell me something, I'm always like, that sounds a little bit like a, a limiting belief. You know, I think like an external perspective can oftentimes help to uh, maybe identify limiting beliefs faster. Um, but it's not to say that you can't do it on your own. I do a lot of self-reflection. I journal a lot and um, I journal every day. And um, yeah, and I think just sometimes maybe thinking the same over and over and over and over and over again, kind of that repetition thought of like maybe the fears that you're going into, the the excuses that you tell yourself that kind of stop you from stepping into your power. I think those are often limiting beliefs. Okay. And so that's how you can identify them. Yeah. At the moment you experience fear or mm -hmm. anxiety. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. And, and okay. So, so you, you, you uh, had this book, amazing book of um, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza. I read, um, You are the placebo. Mm -hmm. That was also kind of uh, opening my eyes to the unconscious mind that I, I thought like, oh yeah, of course, uh, I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. And and how are, have you been implementing this into your own method? Yeah. How do you shift that? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's a great question. So I want to, so yeah, so let's finish really quickly on, so what do you do? Right. So yeah. now you have identified it. <laughs> so what do you do next? Right. <laughs> that's always the next big question because again, oftentimes these beliefs come like date back to uh, your, your childhood, right. Or to like things that your parents were absolutely sure of. And you have just You know, you took that on because you never questioned your parents, right? Um, maybe at least not when you were little. So, so first of all, you have awareness. Then uh, you oftentimes, you know, so there's a couple of different things that you can do. I think meditation is a really powerful tool to write, to kind of rewire your brain. Meditation helps you with that because instead of sitting in your conscious mind, you're going more into the subconscious mind. And that's where those limiting beliefs are anchored. And I have to say that I have not been... a big meditator for years. I was, you know, I mentioned earlier, I have a 400 hour yoga teacher training certification, but I was always like meditation. Uh, I can't really sit still and I don't really like it. And I didn't really practice it um, for a really long time until this year where I went through a kind of an own personal crisis. And I was, you know, I identified a lot of limiting beliefs and really wanted to work through them. And then I like sat down and started to meditate actually with meditations from Dr. Joe Dispenza. And I think it really, really changed the way of how I think about meditation. So um, I can only say that, you know, <laughs> if you, if you feel like, oh, meditation is not for me, you know, sometimes you have to kind of just keep on trying it. And I, I kept obviously trying it because I was in yoga teacher retreats and things like that. But anyway, long story short, meditation can help, I think, re really rewriting your limiting beliefs. Um, you know, I think a lot of us hold the belief that we are not worthy of the things that we want or we, we don't maybe deserve everything we want. And um, I have literally in my bathroom, on my bathroom mirror, um, the positive affirmation that I, that I deserve it all. And those little re daily reminders are so, so important to rewire your brain because from a neuroscience perspective, you have this like deep wire of how you've been thinking. So in order to redirect that, you have to create this new neural neuro pathway and that will take some time and it will require repetition. And you are repeating it by reading new affirmations, by saying them out loud, by doing meditations and, and diving deep into maybe understanding where they came from. All of that work will help you become a new person. But I think we need to walk away from immediate results and immediate you know, things that are happening in the moment, but, and understand that some things are also taking time and some things are a process, especially when we have been thinking them over years and years and years. And so I think to have a little bit of patience and curiosity to be like, okay, I'm, I'm, I've identified this and I'm going to help really my brain to, to redirect or to create this neural pathway and to just be curious about that. I think it's really powerful. I, I always say, you know, 
um, remember, like when you are, for example, somebody that doesn't like to go to the gym or doesn't like to work out, and then you are setting that goal that you're going to start to go to the gym. Your brain is going to come up with the most interesting excuses and stories of why you are not doing it, right? And I always say that is the brain that is that old part of your brain of that old neural pathway that is telling you, but it's not safe to do this other thing because we've been not working out for 30 years. Right. Um, and I literally have an internal dialogue with myself when I'm observing these things happening, when I'm observing my mind, giving me those like old cues. And I literally have an internal dialogue where I'm like, Hey, I know why this is coming up. I know this is why, because my brain is just keeping me safe, trying to keep me safe because it is what it is used to. But And I have to show my brain through positive experiences that it is still safe when it's doing this other thing. And this is how I think you can overcome this like first moment of difficulty when you are trying to create a new habit or a new routine. Because I think once you have the positive feedback and the positive experience after maybe pushing yourself sometimes to do something that doesn't feel comfortable in the first moment, but then to be like, wow, this actually felt really good. Or this really helped me um, feel better, feel less anxious. Then you will do it again. And then obviously the repetition will help you to create the neural, the new neural pathway. So. Yeah. And, and it's so difficult. Helpful. Yeah. It's it so, difficult. so difficult. <laughs> it's so difficult just to admit that it really helped, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. And I think there are something, you know, I think there are limiting beliefs that are easier to overcome than others. You know, I think, you know, I think of my morning routine. I really love my morning routine. I don't have a problem to ever do it ever. Right. Like I even like when I go on vacation or during the weekend, I like to do it because it's, it's such a huge positive benefit for me. But then there are limiting beliefs that I still struggle with today. And then I'm still working through on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and that's just kind of part of life, you know? Yeah, well, I think that's life. <laughs> yeah, that is life. Yeah, that's sure. life about. Can you tell us yeah. what is your, your routine in the morning? Yes, my morning routine. Um, I try to not look at my phone for the first hour of the day because I think that all of the messages that come in through the night, and I'm obviously European, so I still have a lot of family and friends in Europe and my WhatsApp is full of messages in the morning. Um, I try to just start myself and start with what I need in the morning to refill my energy reserve. So I get up, don't look at my phone. I usually let my dog out and then I sit down with a warm glass of lemon water and a tea and I journal and I practice gratitude. Um, and once I've kind of completed that process, then I make breakfast and I check my phone. Sometimes I go for, I go for a run or a workout in the morning as well. It depends. I change it up a little bit, but I usually try to be very mindful when I get up and let my dog out to like, you know, get five minutes of fresh air with my dog and like get the, the natural sunlight to signal to my body. Okay. It's, you know, we're waking up now. And like, I think there's a lot of science behind that as well of signaling to your body that you are ready, ready to start the day. So yeah, yeah that's how I'm starting. And, and before the burnout, you didn't have a routine. No. <laughs> before the burnout my routine was to roll over to my bedside table and scroll through emails messages and social media for 30 45 minutes and then I would kind of get up already stressed and anxious about uh, everything that I had to get done throughout the day <laughs> yeah I, I know that I know that and about meditation well it, it's so uh, interesting to um to hear from you that you were not a meditator well i wasn't as well until i got burned out and then uh meditation actually uh helped me to recover my short-term memory with was really destroyed i had blackouts and i had couldn't remember even what uh, the names were of the people i was training it was really horrible and uh and i thought maybe i just got dementia and i'm not to die without knowing my own name <laughs> <laughs> but um but the other dispenser was right in this again mm -hmm. uh it it all came back it all came back and uh there there is so much to to tell about that that um it's nice that you also experience the same benefits um mm -hmm. so 
you know, this was a difficult period. And I just wonder because uh, people who have been through this and as you told us, it's nothing but nice. Um, did you have support from fans and family? How, how did you find your environment uh, when you had mm. burnout? Good question. Um, I think, you know, they always say you are the five people that you surround yourself with. And um, I have a very close relationship with my sister. So she was always, she is, she has always been there for me and she is always still here for me. And I'm super grateful for her. And she's a pharmacist as well. So she is also always able to um, explain things to me on a more biochemical level <laughs> when things are happening. Um So I definitely had her support and she actually helped. She kind of opened myself up to the whole coaching personal development space because she really got into it and, you know, she would share her experience and her new learnings and that kind of drew me into that whole space. So that was definitely a super, super influential person in my life. Um, my family and friends, you know, I think the reason why I'm hesitant to uh, mention any others is, is because I think because burnout is such a, it's such a thing that you don't really see, right? Like I said, I wasn't really physically sick. I didn't have a broken arm or broken leg and I could be like, yeah, I'm, I am sick, you know, like I, I'm not well. Um, and I think it's a lot harder for people to understand. And, you know, I think I just got to a point in my life where I knew I just had to take care of myself. I knew that people didn't like some people, like my closest, like my partner at the time, um, didn't maybe fully understand what was going on with me and why I was, you know, making the decisions that I was making at that point. But, you know, I trusted myself that I needed to do what was right for me. And that was extremely difficult, of course, right? Especially also through that whole process of going through burnout and then making the decision to leave Google and having, you know, parents in Germany that are, super conservative and that are like, why would you leave a company like Google? You know, that was difficult. Um, but I really, like I, like I said, I had the support from my sister and I think I just surrounded myself with people that, that had done it or that had stepped into their power. And I was just following people that had done it. So there was, for example, an ex-Googler Her name is Jenny Blake. She's a career coach today, very successful career coach. And so I would look into how she started her own business and try to get inspiration from there. I was listening to podcasts and books. I think the five people that you surround yourself with is not just the people in your direct environment, but it's also just the things that you let into your mind, right? The things that you're listening to, the things that you're reading. And so I just try to... Uh, focus my attention and my energy on those positive um influences yeah yeah right it, it's a, it's a difficult moment i know from all yeah. the the stories i've have heard uh it's difficult for the family especially because they really don't understand as you say it's not something you can see from outside yeah. uh, like how do you explain anxiety or how do you explain that you are depressed you know or You know, I think one of my biggest, and I'm, you know, I'm, I always like to share that openly as well. Like I, I consider myself an extremely strong person, an extremely strong mindset. Um, but towards the end, before I went to the doctor, I had more and more thoughts of self-harm. I was thinking to myself, oh, if only I would have a car accident, I wouldn't need to go to the, to the, to work anymore. I wouldn't need to do this drive anymore. Like I had self-harming thoughts. And that was obviously very extremely scary for me. And, um, and I shared that even with, you know, some people in my direct environment and they still didn't take me seriously. And sometimes you can't wait for the support of other people to, uh, to make a decision. You know, it, I was gladly still in the, in full capacity to be like, this is not normal. And I need to speak with a doctor about this and I need to pull myself out of this of these thought patterns. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's not easy, but you know, you need to take care of yourself and nobody else knows what's really going on with you. So you need to step up for yourself. Yeah, sure. And you also have to be a little bit lucky to find the right doctors, the, the right persons mm -hmm. to help you. Not everybody. I mean, it's still something that has to be discovered. 
Um, and where, and I, yeah, isn't it? I mean, there's so much about it, so much. Yeah. Um, so we are going to discover this in the next years. And I would like to move now um, with what you are working uh, on your project, your uh, actually, um, it's your company. Yeah. <laughs> it's your own mm -hmm. company. And maybe yeah. you get, uh, well, not so big as Google, but you can go very far with this because uh, burnout is everywhere. It's worldwide and it will only get I mean, uh, worse, I think. As well, yeah. So. so, well, tell me, you, mm. I want to hire you for a big company because you can tell us how to avoid burnouts. Mm. How can we do that? Yes. So over the course of the first year in business, I talked to a lot of obviously people. I had one-on-one -on -one coachings. I trained people um, in, you know, group settings. And there were themes that came out over and over again. So that was a really interesting process for me because initially when I started my company, it was called Blue Mountain Mindfulness. And it was all just about self-care, stress management, um, more like kind of these like physical, softer skills, physical skills, but softer skills as well. And then over the course of that first year, I got a lot of insights from clients of what they were really struggling with. And they were struggling with them managing their time and they were struggling with setting boundaries and they were struggling with limiting beliefs. So I basically collected these reoccurring themes and put them into a model that I call today the peak performance method. And it's basically a combination of nine different components that I believe are the nine things that people should learn and should master in order to sustain their performance over time. So if people consider themselves as peak performers, right, they have always gotten a great, like always an A student, right? Great, great grades in school and um, great internships, great, amazing opportunities in companies or building their own business, like extremely smart people, but they have also learned to push their boundaries in very unhealthy ways to get to the point where they are today. And unfortunately, that will, uh, fortunately, I guess, maybe for the first few years that works, but over the course of the time, it doesn't. So I've seen many people, like close friends of mine, burn out, get panic attacks and anxiety attacks that we would have never, ever thought they would be those kind of people, right? But but it's just like we are pushing our physical and mental limits and we are just not designed to work 365 days a year, 24 seven, right? All of this different things. So the peak performance method, nine different components, and it's basically a combination of mindfulness tools, productivity tools, and leadership tools. Because I, like I said, through that experience working with different people, it was really eye-opening for me um, what people were struggling with and how they went down that rabbit hole. But I will explain it in a very different way. So and um, one of the component, there's like basically three main components and then each three has like three sub components. And one of the components is the work dimension. And in the work dimension, we talk about time management, setting boundaries and how to communicate boundaries with vulnerability and manage people. And, um, you know, this is usually actually the first thing that I start with, because I always tell people, how are you going to, uh, practice self-care and how you're going to make sure to balance your fight off flight response, which is on all the time when you're working and when you're in these stressful environments, when you don't have time and people, you know, people do that all the time. They are like, okay, you know, I've got this other emergency meeting on my calendar. Or I have this to do or that to do. I'm just going to cancel my plans, right? Because that's the easiest thing I can cross out from my, from my agenda. And that's the biggest mistake that you can make. So I'm really trying to help people. And that's also what I do with corporate, especially, right? I help their employees really go through a step-by-step -step program on how to manage time and calendars because there's so much improvement and optimization to be done because I think nobody has ever really learned how to manage their time and calendar, right? We are just saying yes to everything. We are, again, we are peak performers, right? We think we can do it all. We want to do it all. We are very curious people. Um, but then we just spread ourselves too thin and we don't have enough time for ourselves. And I think, um, 
yeah, as we are just pushing our bodies, we need to be more and more aware that it has not just a physical effect, but also mental effect on us. All right. So, and let me say you have other three, two components for uh, your method. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about it? The other two? Yes. Yeah. So the first dimension is the um, understanding yourself kind of dimension. And in the first dimension, there are three, the three subcomponents are values, routines, and self-care. So we're diving really into how like the neuroscience of um, the basic needs dimension. Sorry, I was just thinking, what, what is the name of the dimension? So yeah, the basic needs dimension um, comprises values, self-care and routines, because I think people need to understand basically what I just explained in this podcast, right? Like, how do I build habits and routines? How is it linked neuroscientifically, right? Um, and then build really self-care tools based on our own values. I think oftentimes what happens when people burn out is, is that they are not really aligned with their values to their work anymore, which is what happened to me over time, right? Because I fell in love with the mountains. I wanted to be here. So my values shifted. It was important for me to be in a quiet, serene environment, um, which was obviously very different to Silicon Valley. Um, and so that, that became really important for me. And so my job down there wasn't aligned anymore with what I really needed. So I think values is a really important topic. And then the third dimension is the personal development dimension. And in the personal development dimension, we cover mindset, resilience, and emotional intelligence. And I think emotional intelligence is such a beautiful topic, such a beautiful leadership topic as well, because when you learned all of these other actually eight steps in the peak performance method in the program, you will see how it all actually feeds into being emotionally intelligent and being a good leader because you can only be a good leader and have a high EQ when you actually understand yourself. There's, you know, there's four parts of emotional intelligence and the first part is self-awareness and you can't be a good people leader if you don't understand yourself, because if you don't understand yourself, you, you won't recognize what other people are going through. And so, yeah, so those are, and, you know, um, resilience and mindset have a lot of um, research uh, backed insights as well around the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. You know, how do I change my mindset to believe that I can actually do things? Um, and then also more softer skills like, um, forgiving and, um, you know, letting go of things in the past that are not helping us anymore, um, in the way of how we want to move forward. So those are the nine components. Um, so I have a full, obviously 10 week program on these nine pro on, on these nine components. Um, but then when I work with corporations, we usually either do a one-off training session for one specific topic. So they choose, for example, time management or setting boundaries, or they choose um, a list of topics. So we do like a six month series on all of the different topics of the peak performance method. And I come in once a month for an hour to train their employees on the next step of how to sustain performance. Because I think, you know, the problem with um, employee burnout nowadays as well as is, is that they are so overloaded. They, they go maybe to a one hour training, but then it's very hard for them to stick to that, right? They listen to it. They might be inspired, but then they go back to their old lives and they don't really implement anything. And I think my biggest goal always, and I try to have my workshops as interactive as possible, have as many exercises as possible, have, have as many tools as possible to share with the participants. So they really walk away with having have something implemented in their calendar that they can try out right away to kind of start that process of building new neural pathways. Yeah. And Julia, do you think, because th this is a very, very interesting topic you're now touching, it's um, the change. I mean, of course, it has to come from within each employee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have the, if you don't get the support from above, and then I mean, whomever is above you, it's going to be very difficult. Mm -hmm. And many times it's, it, it's about uh, time, but it's of course about money. Mm -hmm. um, when you have, when you get a, a, um, 
a request from a company, uh, do you have any kind of tactic to say, well, I would like to train first, you know, like the director and the, I'm a CEO and then the, the chairs, you know, or whatever. I mean, you're the older directors, uh, because if you go in that direction, it might just be easier to make it like a big change in a company. I mean, I don't know, maybe that's the case, but can also be that you only have to, to, um, train uh, employees. Um, yeah, I always encourage leaders to be there. You know, usually it's not the leaders that reach out to me to schedule a workshop. It's usually their, you know, assistants, um, their, their administrative business partners. Um, it's tough. It's definitely tough. I think there is a, there's something to be said about individual versus corporate responsibility. You know, I think a lot of people, it depends on where they are. I, you know, I think it depends on where people are in their journey when they are already very burned out, they will invest the money and they will invest the time because it hurts, right? Because they are not at their best anymore and they want to get back to feeling how they were feeling before that happened. And so I think then that threshold of actually investing in their well-being is a lot lower. Um, unfortunately, when people haven't experienced burnout yet, they are less inclined, obviously, to spend time and money. And this is still something that I'm working on, right? That's still, I am still like my mission is to bring the peak performance method into onboarding programs, because I think that employees need to learn these tools when they start their journey in a company, not five years later when they are already burned out and they have created all these unhealthy habits and routines, right? Where they stay up until nine or 10 o'clock in the evening every night to get their work done and connect five times during the weekend to check their emails because other people are still answering emails as well. Um, I think it needs to get start at the beginning. Um, and this is still something that I'm still working on. Like I said, this, this is not something that I have unfortunately figured out yet. Um, but I really believe that. And so, you know, when people are listening right now and they think, ah, oh, but my company is not investing, you know, don't make your company responsible for how you are feeling. There's an individual responsibility to, to be your best self and to, to take action, to, to continue to sustain your performance over time. Um, and I always say, you know, I have invested so much money in my own personal development over the last few years. And I always say the money that I spent there is invaluable. Like it's, it's, I mean, you, you pay money for a service, right? You pay for a program or you pay for a coach, but the amount of insight you gain and the amount of growth you get from working with a therapist, working with a coach, going through different programs, learning things is invaluable because you are, because it makes you feel so much better. And there's no price tech at the end of the day on our physical and mental health, I believe. And there shouldn't be for anyone. Um, and so, so yeah, so I think people need to just shift their mindset. It's a mindset shift of I am paying this money to this person. Is this person even worth the money to, I am investing this money in myself. Am I worth this money? You know, <laughs> is my, is my mental health worth this money? Um, will I grow from this? And I think I would say even from maybe a mediocre coach or therapist, you still learn, you know, there's still always insights that you come out that come out of it. And so I will always encourage people to invest in their, in themselves and to learn more about, um, how they, how they work and what kind of beliefs they're, they're there and different things. Yeah. And, uh, I think anyway, this knowledge that will be in your, uh, I mean, that you can implement in your life and will always yeah. have turnovers, you know, you will always have something from it. And, um, yeah. I think, um, And, you know, once you know something, you will never forget it again. You know, yeah. like once you are on that next level, on that next higher level of awareness, you're not going to go back down. You are on a higher level of consciousness. Um, I, you know, and I, it's so funny. I think that all the time, you know, I'm always like, wow, now I'm like so aware. I wasn't as aware like a year or two ago. And, and you know, and that, you know, and you think on oh, like, now I know everything kind of a thing, you know, I mean, I don't, but, but, and then a year later you look back and you're like, wow, like I still had all of these limitations, you know, it's really such a beautiful process, um, to go through. 
Yeah, to see, uh, to look back and say, oh, I'm, I'm so far now, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I think many board of directors just would, would like to hear what it uh, costs to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, someone who's burned out. And then when you put, when you put the, the, the numbers on paper, then they realize how expensive yeah. it is. Yes. Well, and they also want immediate results. They want things to, you know, I talk to corporate teams all the time that are like, but in that one hour, we want all of these things that the people all do differently. And I'm like, well, not the, I mean, I can share those things, obviously, but it depends on the people if they will take the necessary steps to actually implement those tools, you know? Um, it's always our own responsibility. It's not the other person's responsibility. Yeah, of course, of course. And and it, it seems what you're talking about is your method with uh, these nine uh, kind of um, uh, steps or um, three dimensions. It's very broad. It, it's really very mm. complete. It's really like I, I would spend with each one like almost three months. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because um, there's people who are stuck in all, you know, is all beliefs and it, it would take maybe even longer. So what do you do if you, when well, you, 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 you finish with a, with a course and the, um, maybe their results are not so big as, as expected. What, what can mm -hmm. you do? You do one-on-one -on -one coaching or you, uh, mm -hmm. what, how do you work? Yeah, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching too. You know, it's really an introduction. It's very, I'm glad that you're saying this is so funny. Um, You know, people that go through the 10 week program with me, they, they always say, I need more time. This is so much information and it's all really valuable, but it will, it takes me more time to implement it. And I've been working with people and talking with people sometimes, you know, over six months, a year, two years, um, to see how they're in integrating these things, because I think it's all just kind of, again, more like that introduction and kicking off that awareness of like, okay, this is actually where I'm standing. And then I start to integrate all of these different things into my life. And that, and that takes time. And so sometimes I have, you know, I have incredibly motivated people that I work with that are very, very motivated to implement everything right away. And they will do it. Some people are just like self um, motivated that way. And then some people need more help. And so, you know, I work with leaders um, in different tech and um, startup companies that are hiring me to help them through that process and to hold them accountable every week to, uh, you know, look into their calendars and manage their time and optimize their calendar and their time in a way that to create space for themselves and create space for their own values and for their own priorities. Um, And it's a beautiful process. I love to work one-on-one -on -one with people because it gives me actually a lot of insights. Then again, obviously for my trainings, I have a YouTube channel and I um, record a video every week on different tools on how to sustain performance over time. And, um, and I love this process. I think it's, it's really beautiful and you shouldn't expect to be perfect in an hour workshop after an hour workshop or after a three months program. But, you know, I get a lot of feedback from a lot of my clients that it does work. And so I think that obviously helps me, like it gives me a lot of confidence to be like, I know this works, like yeah. it, it works and it depends on how much, how much work you put in and as much work you put in, you, the more you will get out because it works. Of course. And uh, so good reviews. That's, that's good to know. <laughs> um, but have you ever met someone or have you, um, um, yeah. Um, that the yeah, someone who doesn't know what their values are sometimes mm -hmm. you are it's like what you're telling me you at a certain point you are like this person google minded and you know you have the google colors in your in your mm -hmm. t-shirt and yes then suddenly <laughs> you are not part of google anymore who are you mm -hmm. you know do you <laughs> have you have this with yes people? i have people for sure They, I have people that are in an identity crisis, but, you know, like through reflection, through just taking some time to actually sit down and read, like I usually have like a list of a hundred values. So people, you know, obviously get a little bit of help of what it is. Um, and there's obviously other ways of how you can observe what is important for you. You know, you can see how you're spending your time throughout the day how important that is for you, you know, or what you would like to do, but you don't spend the time on that. That's also an interesting indicator. Um, 
but yeah, I feel like I, I usually, like usually the first thing that people say is always like, mm, I don't really know. But then if, when they take time to reflect, I think just the space sometimes to take five, 10 minutes, sit down and be really intentional about finding an answer <laughs> to a question will actually help you get there. But I think people, especially burnt out people, super stressed out people, they don't really take the time anymore for self-reflection. Um, I think that is honestly usually the biggest obstacle to to finding insights. Yeah, but that, that's a big obstacle, and it's the, I think the root of the problem. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that when you really uh, lose yourself. So let, let's say, uh, Julia, that um, I'm uh, uh, the director of big company, and I ask, like, well, give me some advice. Just shoot. <laughs> what yeah, what, what can, can I, I what can I do? Yeah, tell me. Yeah. I I think the first advice is always to uh, just track your time for a day and see where you spend your time and see how how well your time is aligned with your priorities. I think this is the first step. Um, and then how much time obviously you have for yourself. Um, I think, you know, it's part of the program. The peak performance program has an actual um, 10 week tracker as well, a daily tracker where you have to write down how you're feeling, what kind of thoughts you have. Um, um, and at the beginning, my participants are always like, mm, <laughs> I don't like journaling or I don't like to do this. Or I'm not really good at that. And then they, they have a workbook so they can kind of fill it out in the workbook. And oftentimes, like not very much later, maybe a week or two in where they really force themselves to do it. They always give me the feedback. This is so eye opening of what are actually things that I should look more into and the things that are not super well optimized or the things that are actually on my mind on a regular basis that I hadn't really paid attention to, but they're always there. Right. So I think really awareness and observation is always the first starting point. So if you are feeling burned out and stressed out director, (laughs) then just start with tracking your time and maybe answering two or three really basic questions for a week, every single day and see what kind of comes up for you when you do that. So, okay. So that's the starting point. Mm -hmm. That's the starting point. Okay. And, um, well, let's say for the, for the uh, audience who, uh, would, uh, maybe are getting very interested in your method. Um, let's say, well, they go to uh, your website, which you're going to tell us where you can be found, but do you have, um, also a material we can download or a Mm -hmm. book maybe, uh, what, what have you uh, been doing lately? (laughs) Yes. Well, I'm, so, I'm very busy. I, I, like I mentioned, I record a video every week and I also have a podcast. Um, so, so yeah, so my website is peakperformancemethod.com. My YouTube channel is just under my name, Julia Arndt, Julia, J-U-L-I-A, and then Arndt is A-R-N-D-T. Um, and there's a video every week that I post on and I share so much information and so much content and so much insight. I do a lot of exercises in my YouTube videos as well to help people kind of get go along and really implement. I'm really trying to get people to do things because I know that the, I know the power behind doing, right? Like I said earlier, the work that you put in will come back to you if you do put in the work. There's a really famous quote that I oftentimes um, state, which is the greatest gap in life is between knowing things and doing things. I think we do know a lot of things. Um, I think we are a culture and a society of having all the information available to us, but are we doing it? That is going to make us successful, you know? And so the YouTube channel, I think is a really great starting point. And it's really funny. You are asking me about the book because actually today, um, I am publishing a book with 32 other authors called winning mindset and, um, winning mindset is available on Amazon and all different countries. So you can buy it in Germany, you can buy it in the Netherlands, and so on. Um, and winning mindset is, I contributed a chapter in that book around my own story of how, who I was and who I identified with, how I became a peak performer and how I got to the realization that things had to change in my life. And a little bit more about the peak performance method and how to start changing things in your life. So yeah, so that would be, um, a super easy way as well to start that journey. 
Great, that, that's great news. <laughs> I'm going yeah. to have a look. It's that's the uh, news. And um, so, Julia, well, we have covered quite some things, um, yeah. and um, I'm really liking your method a lot. It really sounds mm -hmm. so complete to me. I mean, I, I've re I've read a lot about burnout and how to get out. And fortunately, I'm out of it. Uh, But um, I, I wanted to ask you, do you have something you can share with our audience um, about especially um, now you, you look back and you say, well, I'm, I'm very, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's in the past, it's gone. Mm -hmm. And but uh, for people that are right at this moment, really experience a lot of stress and anxiety, what mm -hmm. would you tell them? Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting you say you are out of it and I'm out of it because I think it's a lifelong learning and process. I have moments where I'm way more anxious again or stressed again, right? Because also personal circumstances sometimes influence our our be well-being, right? Um, but going back to when I burned out and I think the message that I needed to hear most at the time was that I need to take care of myself. I think... I felt extremely, extremely guilty to leave on a medical leave and to get this three months um, medical leave from my doctor. But I, there was no other way for me anymore. Like I said, I had, you know, these thoughts on my mind that weren't really healthy. And my physically, I was super burned out. And I felt extremely guilty to leave my job, my team, my project. And then when I came back three months later, I realized that and this is something that i think a lot of us have a hard time hearing but nobody really cared that i was gone when you work in a company you are at the end of the day and it's maybe sad maybe it's not sad i think for me it was a huge relief to have that realization that i was just a number i was just a person and my team deeply cared about how, how i was as a person, how I was physically and mentally, but I didn't care at the end of the day if that project got done because there was somebody else in the company that could take care of it and could take over. And they did take over, you know? And so when I, today, when I talk to, sometimes I talk to leaders that are extremely burnt out and that are thinking about taking a leave and that are super scared of this decision. Right. And I always say to them, nobody will take your hand and tell you to go you need to make this decision for yourself. And it's an incredibly difficult decision, but it's an in incredibly empowering one. And I can tell you from my experience today that it's the best thing I've done for my own life, for my own well-being, but also because I realized that I wasn't the center of the world. And we have that identity and we would like, we want to believe, especially as peak performers, that we are the center of the world and that we are, that we do matter to other people, but we matter to other people because of who we are. And I think when we are showing that vulnerability to step in for ourselves, it allows other people to follow suit as well. And that's extremely powerful. And so If you are struggling right now and you are thinking about taking some time off, do it because it will be the best thing you can do for yourself and everything else will somehow be figured out. Like everything is figure out. I love that phrase um, because it really is, you know, but first of all, you need to think of your own well-being. Wow. What a powerful advice. <laughs> It's really the advice of the year. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it, it's true. Julia. I mean, you have been uh, uh, telling us things that are very difficult to tell, actually, mm -hmm. to admit uh, to an audience. Um, but by doing it, you're empowering other people to follow and to, to, to look inside and to uh, not to get burnt out. And, uh, and whenever you feel like burnt out, how to get out of it. So it's really amazing. Thank you very much, Julia, for all your words Pleasure. and showing, uh, well, sharing actually a, a bit about your method. And I'm going to, well, to say bye-bye. Okay. Thank you so much, Gabriela, for having me. This was wonderful. <laughs>